I'm so glad I get to go after Rodrigo. I set him up. It's great to be back in Porto Alegre. Thank you all for, for being here and for having me back. Two years ago when I was here, everybody was looking at their phones, checking to see what the vote was on the impeachment of your president. This year, as I came to Porto Alegre, everybody was looking at their phones to watch video of you arresting your president. Since we are talking about change, change is happening in Brazil, and it's beautiful to see. But this is really just the beginning. Putting a president who is corrupt in jail is relatively easy. Because Lula's crimes, the crimes of the presidents you've impeached, are not primarily the fact that they committed fraud. Yes, legally, those are the crimes. But the real crimes of our politicians, the real crimes of Lula and Lula-like, is their interest, is their use of force, coercion to control our life, to manage our economy, to steal our wealth, and to destroy, to destroy the potential that is Brazil, the potential that is every country out there in the world. I was told that a poor person in, uh, in Brazil, while he might make a thousand rias a month, the company paying him is paying another thousand rias to the government. Imagine what that person could do with his life, with 2,000, with double the income. I have a, I have a project to alleviate pro, uh, 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 poverty in, in, uh, in uh, Brazil, particularly in Rio de Janeiro. I call it privatize the favelas. I don't get, this is so easy, right? Nobody pays a price. It's so easy. Every person who has built a home on government land, which there shouldn't be any of, gets to own that land. Give them a deed. Now, I've been to the favelas in Rio, and I'm putting the first bid on some of that land at the top, just above Impatema and Copacabana, with the most beautiful views in the world. Right? The fact that the government doesn't do that, it costs zero Rias, zero dollars. The fact that instead, they restrict our freedoms to create businesses, to build, to employ people. That is the real crime that is going on in every country in the world, but certainly in Brazil. And this is really difficult to change. This is where we need to change the fundamental ideas in our culture. We need to change our approach to government, our views of what government should and shouldn't do. We need to choose political leaders that dismantle the operations of government, not make them more efficient and build on them, as so many of, uh, of your presidential candidates yesterday suggested. We need a revolutionary, and I know Rodrigo doesn't like revolutions, but we need a revolution. It doesn't happen easy, easily. And the revolution we need is an ideological revolution. There's a lot of work to do in Brazil. There's a lot to do, of work to do everywhere in the world. Indeed, one gets a feeling, particularly in Latin America, that the left is in retreat. That socialism is hunkered down. If you look at Argentina, the kids is out. Here you've arrested Lula. In Colombia, they're going to have an election soon that looks like will go against the socialists. But the question has to be, okay, we figured out finally, it's taken us long enough, that that doesn't work. What we haven't figured out, I think, is what does work. Or we haven't have had the political 
the individual will to bring about what does work. And there's a danger I see all over the world. I see it in the United States, I see it in Eastern Europe, and I see it in Latin America. That in rejecting socialism, you will embrace a different kind of collectivism. Just a few days ago, there was an election in Hungary in Eastern Europe where a collectivistic, authoritarian prime minister in the name of patriotism and nationalism won his what? His fourth election because he's got the entire, just like Chavez and Maduro, he's got the entire media rigged in order to support his cause. And that is a real risk, a risk you're familiar with because you have gone on this pendulum from socialism to fascism of various kinds and back again. The real choice and the real change that has to happen is a rejection of collectivism, a rejection of the idea that the group is above the individual, a rejection of the idea that the group should control the individual. And personally, I don't care if that group happens to be leftist or happens to be rightist. I don't want to be controlled. So what needs to be rejected is the whole concept of collectivism. And I fear that by embracing conservatism, a moderate form of collectivism, if you will, soft collectivism, you go nowhere. You advance nowhere. The choice at the end of the day is individualism versus collectivism. And while I did not plan to get into a debate with Rodrigo, I have to say, I don't know anybody, anybody, who thinks that individualism means you don't care about the world, that individualism means that you don't care about your neighbor, that individualism means a desert island. Yeah, that's my dream, to live on a desert island. That's why I'm here with 4,000 people in Porto Alegre. That's not what individualism means. That's never what individualism meant. It's certainly what Ayn Rand, it's not what Ayn Rand meant when she talked about egoism or selfishness or individualism. It means that you are the primary, that your life is most important, that you should live the best life you could live for you. And believe me, that doesn't involve living on a desert island. I love people. Everybody loves people. And as Anne pointed out, I don't even know how to make toast. I couldn't survive for five minutes without all the gadgets, without all the instruments, without the food and the clothes and everything else that other people produce. There is no such thing as the individualism of a desert island. It is a red herring. But what we need to embrace is the idea, the moral idea, the moral idea of the primacy of the individual. Not to define himself as a dolphin, which is, I guess, okay, if they can swim. If they can't, it's a problem. No, but the individualism, the serious individualism, of taking care of self, of using one's reason to guide one's life, to pursue the values that are really necessary for the achievement of your own happiness, happiness your own success, your own flourishing as a human being. And of course some of those values mean other people. Of course you care about where you live. Although both Rodrigo and I have left where we originally li lived to find better places to live for ourselves. <laughs> Everything I say is true. <laughs> the challenge we face is that collectivism is easy, it's appealing, it's emotionally pleasing. To be part of the group is warm and fuzzy and nice. But whenever you give that group power over you, you are losing a part of yourself and losing a part of your life. And that you should never, ever allow. The individual should always stand supreme. And we should build and think about creating a political system that allows him to do exactly that. 
And guess what he does when he stands supreme? He builds businesses that, whether he means to or not, help everybody else. You cannot be successful. You cannot be wealthy. You cannot make money in a free market. I'm not talking about Brazil. I'm talking about a free market. <laughs> Without making the world a better place to live. That is a fact. Pursuing your self-interest leads to making the world a better place. And of course you care about that because you live in this world, not on a desert island. Change is hard. And we're talking about how individuals can bring about change. Because only individuals can bring about change. Whether it's the geniuses, the Miseses, the Rands, the great thinkers over centuries, the Aristotles, who really change whole cultures and teach us. But more importantly, it's all of us. We as individuals can bring about the change that is needed. But first we have to know what change we want. If we value individualism, then we have to know what it stands for. We have to understand it. If we value freedom, we have to know what it is and, what it's, and how to bring it about. We need to study it. So before we change the world, before we change Brazil, your first job should be to change yourself. Educate yourself. Get to know what you are fighting for. Know the history. History that Anne described. The fact that all throughout human history, for example, we have lived in, in poverty, in horrific poverty. Poverty is the normal state of life for human being. Wealth is the exception. It's an achievement. And the question we must decide, we must discover, is how to achieve. We need to train ourselves to become real advocates for the kind of change we want. We need to educate ourselves in that change. And then we need to go out there into the world. And we need to talk to people, because you know what? Selfish people like us, me anyway, we care about the world. We want to change it. So we go out there and we talk. People are ignorant. It's sad, but people are ignorant. They're ignorant of history. They're suddenly ignorant of economics. They're ignorant about what their own life needs in order to be successful. What their own life needs in order for them to flourish. To bring about change, you need to go out there and teach, and educate, and explain. It's the only tool we have. Because we don't believe in using a gun to convince people. All you have then left is reason, and science, and facts, and truth. And the amazing thing is, the wonderful thing is, is that all of those are on our side. We own history. History is on the side of liberty, if you care about human flourishing. History is on the side of capitalism, if you care about human flourishing. History is on the side of the pursuit of self-interest by respecting the rights of others, if you care about human flourishing. The economics, the science of economics is on our side. The facts are on our side. This shouldn't be that hard. It's a matter of knowing what we're talking about and going out there and doing the job. And right now I know everybody's very motivated, very passionate. After all, you just put Lula in jail. And things, the economy has not been good and that got young people motivated. The challenge is if the economy gets better to keep the fire to keep the passion, to keep the commitment. There are very few people in the world that I've seen as passionate as you Brazilians are about the causes you believe in. But when things start getting better economically in the years to come, hopefully they will, don't give up, don't forget, don't settle. Average 
is not good enough. Having GDP grow a little bit is not good enough. What we are after, what you should be after, is freedom. Not a compromised freedom, not a middle of the road freedom, not a conservative freedom, but a revolutionary type of freedom. The freedom that was established to some extent in the United States, at least if you were not black, during the Declaration of Independence or the, or, or the founding of America. The freedom that really we haven't experienced fully in the world as we see. Where the government leaves us alone, but more importantly, where we as individuals take our own happiness seriously, take our own lives seriously, take our own values seriously, and pursue them properly, honestly, rationally. So we as individuals must become better. We as individuals must become models for life, what kind of life is possible. For what kind of life is possible when we are free. If we can attain the knowledge, if we can keep the passion and keep the commitment, and if we can implement those changes in our own lives to make our lives better as individuals, then liberty and freedom, real liberty and freedom, are within our reach. They are not just a science fiction story out there. And what's more valuable to fight for? What's more valuable to go out there and argue for than the freedom of each individual to live his own life the way he sees fit. The liberty of each individual to start whatever business he wants, to create whatever products he wants, to live the kind of life that he believes will lead to his flourishing, to rationally act in his own self-interest. What could be more exciting than to fight for a world in which everybody is left free, in which that graph that Anne talked about, where wealth just accelerates, doesn't stop, but accelerates even faster, and where we're joined by eight billion other people in this accelerated wealth growth. Imagine the Einsteins and the Steve Jobses and the Michelangelos that exist out there in the world who are just waiting to be set free, for their genius to be set free for all of us to benefit from. This is an exciting vision. It's an exciting world that we can have. Don't compromise it. Don't give up on it. Don't lose your passion. We will win. We will win because we are right. We will win because justice is on our side. We will win because human nature is on our side. So as you engage in, um, in political debates over the next four months, I hate elections, hate elections. Don't lose the fire. Don't compromise. Don't forget what you're really in this for. You're in this for your life. You're in this for your liberty. You're in this for your own flourishing and the flourishing of the people around you. Now, I don't have a recommendation on who to vote for. God forbid I should ever do that. But keep the passion, keep the fight, and I hope the next time I come, you won't only have put a president in jail, but you will have taken political steps to move towards freedom and capitalism seriously. Thank you all. So every society, in human history has had this collectivistic tendency. There's nothing unusual about Brazil. You shouldn't think of yourself as somehow special in this regard. Uh, the graph, the, the, the period in which we were all poor starting 250 years ago and going back forever, is filled with countries and eras and tribes and, and who are all collectivistic, every single one of them. France was collectivistic still is. Um, the United States 
the people who came there were very still very when they first came were very in their little groups and in their little tribes. So I think it's a mistake to think that some people are born collectivistic and some people are born individualistic. That's just not the case. And the people who emigrated to the United States from Brazil and from Europe and from Asia and from all over the world, they were all collectivistic when they came. So the question really is, what's the change? What, what is required to shift? And it really is ideas. It's intellectual. It's no accident that the wealth creation that Anne describes happens somewhere in the late 18th century. It's no accident that individualism rises up in the 18th century. It's because we, that period was an intellectual period. Both the French and the Scottish Enlightenment worked hard on creating an individualistic culture. And I think the primary way they did that is by emphasizing human reason, by emphasizing individual reason. It's our capacity, all of our capacity to think, to observe, to integrate, to know reality and discover truth. All of that is what allows us then to also make decisions about ourselves. What we should, what profession we should have, who we should vote for. Think about the world before the Enlightenment. Where did truth come from? Truth came from experts. It came from revelation. It came from a different dimension. It came from the Pope. It came from somewhere else. But individuals had no capacity to know the truth. It is Newton and Locke and the Enlightenment thinkers that reawaken the idea that everybody has the ability to think for themselves and therefore to create for themselves and therefore to live and live free of authorities. And so it's no accident that free economies and free countries arise out of that period. When we think we are impotent, we are impotent. Reason, the discovery of the efficacy of reason makes us efficacious in the world and gives us the self-esteem and the courage to act out there in the world as individuals and then and only then do we demand our freedom. And this has to do with what I said before, you have to change. You have to demand it for yourself. You have to become the kind of person that wants to live under freedom. I mean, I hear a lot about people who say, well, what would the poor do if we didn't have governments? The poor are human beings. They're individual human beings, right? They'll think, they'll go to work, they'll produce, they'll build, they'll create. They don't need you to run their lives for them any more than you want your life run. The idea that we demean a whole group of people because they can't think is exactly the idea we have to overcome in order to achieve in this idea of individualism. So collectivism can be destroyed, but it can only be destroyed with the right ideas. It's all about ideas. It's all about a rediscovery, I guess, again, of the efficacy of individual reason, something we seem to be losing these days. So particularly in this uh, political season, I guess I would recommend forget about politics. We will not be saved by politicians. Ronald Reagan, as much respect as I have for the man, uh, didn't save us. You know, we got eight good years and then back to the same old collectivistic, you know, state involvement. Politics is fleeting. If you want real long-term political change, this is what you do. It's about ideas. It's about studying the right ideas. It's about teaching and it's about educating. One of the reasons, I think the next panel is on free speech. One of the reasons free speech is so important is that we have the ability to educate and to explain and to argue and to debate and to discuss, to influence the minds of other people. Change comes one mind at a time. It does not come from above. It comes from within you. Change you. Change the people around you. 
Educate yourself. Educate them. Learn. Study the ideas of liberty. Create movements. Create projects to spread the ideas of liberty all over Brazil, in poor neighborhoods, in rich neighborhoods, in middle class neighborhoods. Teach the value of the individual, the value of liberty, the value of freedom, and then one day, the politics will take care of themselves. It's always culture first, and before culture is ideas, it's ideas, culture, politics. Focus your energies on where they really matter, on the ideological battle, and have fun doing it.